So Mr. Bat, yeah. tell me how you met You know, Dr. Lionel, I can't even say that I met him. You know, he felt like somebody I had known before I even met him. You know, that kind of South African vibe where when you meet somebody, it's like an uncle that you haven't seen for a very long time. And when you meet, there's this blast of joy, you know, that comes with it. I met him in Burkina Faso. I think it was in 1987 at the uh, at the Fespaco. And uh, when we met, you know, we, we, we just, we just, judged. I mean, he said, how's he party? Unso he party le guy? As if, you know. <laughs> so it was just so funny because we, we just had this catch up thing, you know, with him. So that's how I met him. I met him in Burkina Faso and uh, it was really, uh, a momentous time for me because I met him in this milieu of other African filmmakers. So yeah, you know, it was a, it was really just like a, some kind of a, a love affair with an uncle that you hadn't seen for a very long time. You know, in the 80s, I was in my 20s. So uh, when I went there, I, was, I actually went there as a film student. So I was a, you know, a nobody at, at the time. I was a, an unknown, I had not made any film yet. The only film I had done was a, 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 on Super 8. And uh, it was a short uh, documentary that was about, uh, it was a story of a Sangoma in South Africa, the initiation of a Sangoma. That was the only film that I had made. So when I went there and I found these big giants, you know, these pioneers, I actually just, uh, you know, uh, fell into <laughs> some kind of, of, of oblivion. Um, so that time I was a student and I went there because we were working on Suleiman Caesar's film, which was called Yellen. And uh, we were working on it as trainee uh, filmmakers. So that is really the, uh, or what gave me an opportunity to go and uh, find myself in the space of this huge collective of African filmmakers. And this was my first because we never had anything. I had never seen anything like that. We never had anything like that in South Africa where you just find this mass energy of the creatives, you know, in one space talking about, you know, ideas, you know, promoting their their films, you know, uh, sharing their vision. This, this was something that was, uh, I think, uh, a fantastic um, experience and revelation for me of, of, of what the broader, wider spectrum of African cinema meant because we as South Africans were, you know, living within this insular, you know, a oppressive environment at the time of, of, of apartheid. Uh, you know, I, I don't think that I, I actually saw myself in anything else even before then than an African uh, filmmaker. I, I always set myself in my own setting of, uh, of, of my Africanness. So, I wasn't discovering myself as an African, but I was discovering a broader, you know, concept of who I was because the films that I was seeing, for instance, I was seeing them in different languages, you know. You had films that, I mean, for instance, Yellen was made in Bambara. You know, you had films from Senegal that was made in Wolof. You had, uh, you know, or a mixture of, you know, of English and, and, and indigenous language. So. This was just opening me up to something that I had never seen before. Here in South Africa, we had films that were dubbed into Zulu or, you know, another language, but it was really within our scope of what I knew as an African. So when I went there, my perception of who I was broadened up. And I think that was for me such a, a gift that I carried back home with. Because even the way I started dressing up and, uh, you know, some of the little things that I had found, you know, of great inspiration 
were influencing me differently. And already I was that person, I mean, when I left, you know, to go to Paris and, 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 and uh, study film, that, uh, you know, I just loved being who I was, you know, I felt very comfortable in that, but I questioned a whole host of things even then. And I think this is something that, you know, Lerato haven't really spoken about as South Africans. Because during my time, in Toya Nebizua weave, you know, when you never even knew what it meant. The weaves, we, we just didn't even, you know, you had wigs, women used to wear wigs, but it was not something that was that common. People liked wearing their own natural hairs and it's a, it's a story that is hidden, you know, from our South African cultural conscientious landscape. You know, we just loved being who we were and I think the fight for liberation, you know, to come out of the clashes of apartheid and oppression just made us dig ourselves deeper and deeper into who we were, especially those that were in this medium of, uh, you know, cultural spaces where we were storytellers, you know, we were, you know, sculptors, we were crafters, we were whatever, or painters. There was this very strong sense of identity that we felt and something that really united us as, Africa, as South Africans. So when I went out to Burkina Faso into that landscape of the same kind of collective energy that forged forward to this united aspiration of being Africans together, you know, in this fight for emancipation was just a powerful affirmation and confirmation of what we could be as Africans if we really truly focused on that. And what the, the FESPACO and FEPASI, because I also not, I also did not just discover uh, the FESPACO, I discovered FEPASI, which was uh, something that Bo Uncle Lionel were, were, were pioneering. You know, they pioneered this uh, association of African filmmakers. Uh, and they did that because they wanted to change the way uh, or the power of monopoly that Europeans had or colonizers had on uh, the African image. So they were pioneering that kind of, um, of movement of liberation. So when you had the, the political or, or, or the political activists or, you know, your liberation movement uh, getting into the trenches of war to fight to reclaim their liberation, you also had some kind of a, a different kind of military wing, which was the use of this technology, you know, this art form that we call filmmaking and the Febazi collective or the pioneers of that time were, you know, juxtaposing themselves to what the liberation movements were doing to say, you know, when you fight in the trenches with your rifles, we'll fight in the trenches with our cameras. In fact, you know what, I think it was trying to unite even the Maghreb countries because, you know, the Arab-speaking Africans, in fact, were actually the, 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 the ones who created the inspiration, if I, if I, and I stand to be corrected. Because, you know, in the, I think in the late 60s or, yes, I think in the late 60s, uh, countries like Tunisia and Algeria and perhaps Morocco already had very sophisticated national film institutions which were operating very differently from how sub-Saharan Africa was operating. So they were already, you know, finding their independence, fighting, fighting their voices and also just fighting the power to control the means of production and control the means of distribution and exhibition. So they were already ahead of sub-Saharan Africa in terms of uh, trying to take control of the management of uh, and representation of African of African stories or African images. So uh, um, 
when 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 they they established the FEPASI in the in, in, in 1969 in Algeria, that was the inspiration. There was already some kind of template which uh, Sub-Saharan Africa could work from because already you know we had our brothers and sisters who were already doing it in the Maghreb countries. So the the, the unity obviously. Uh, had to be redefined because remember that with colonization, when the scramble for Africa came, we were scattered into different, you know, uh, compartments. And of course, language also became a, a critical a tool to use against us, to divide us. So the, the, the FEPASI wanted to unite all of this uh, peoples and uh, you know through 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 uh, you know mechanisms that would help us control our cultural economies you know the the uh, control our distribution control our exhibition con control our production it was a huge vision but also a very cumbersome and difficult and complex vision to to manage because obviously uh, FEPAS wasn't going to be allowed to get away with it without the intervention or interference of your, you know, uh, your colonizers. So, you know, you'd always have that, <laughs> that is some kind of, you know, uh, blockage, you know, to, to, to stop us from going forward. But the intention, the vision was to unite. The, that was the, the vision, to unite, to put in every country national film institutions which would work in uh, collaboration with governments uh, where there is a, a social compact between the two between the practitioner and governments through policy to make sure that you know our trade policies interregionally work in tandem you know to complement each other so that you know we could have a co-productions within ourselves as Africans, but also have the backing of the state to make sure that our distribution networks are solid, our exhibition networks are solid. Um, but o o obviously, even then, filmmakers were always worried about the total control of governments. So they wanted to have their col collaboration, have their partnerships, but they also wanted to maintain a very strong sense of uh, our freedom of expression as conscious keepers, as social cultural practitioners. So we needed to have that control of our voices so that we can critique when it be even the, uh, the behavior of our governments, call them to order if we had to. And you could only do that if you had the freedom to function financially without uh, the complete backing of our governments. Because once you have that, obviously, the one that provides the money also pulls the strings. So uh, I think this was you know, some kind of dichotomy that uh, uh, you know, our pioneer filmmakers were, 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 were met with, where you, know, you, you wanted to juggle all of these benefits, but you also had to be very careful how you juggle because you didn't want to lose that very strong sense of you, know, you being the conscience keeper, you being the griot, you being the one who, 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 who sirens when you see something go wrong because you have the, the freedom and you have the boldness to do that, to say, uh -uh, even if you're a king, yeah, you are, you, you are doing it the wrong way, or even if you're the president, or even if you're this. So I think that period was really very telling because uh, uh, it, 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 you know, to, to a point, Pepper succeeded, but it was hampered because it succeeded, because even today it exists as the only organization that represents the entire continent, including the uh, African diaspora. It's the only one that has that kind of, uh, of status and the only one that has a, a, a very direct relationship with the African Union because they share the same kind of principles, you know, the same kind of vision, which is to ensure the total emancipation of Africans from what happened to us, you know, uh, with colonization and, um, and, and in, in South Africa also apartheid. So uh, 
we are here today, you know, many, many years after FEPAS was established. And you can see that the road has not been easy. It has been very treacherous. Um, FEPASI has had many, has, has, has found many obstacles in its way. And uh, sometimes I think even the vision changed, you know, from, from this to that because of what was happening to us as, as Africans. We still could not have the total, complete control over the, the means of uh, production, over the means of distribution, over the means of exhibition. Even with the advent of television, we still struggled to just maintain this very strong sense of presence as a cultural economy. That, that is why you'll find that people in America, for instance, do better, or African, uh, Africa, uh, the diaspora, do better than us in Africa. That, that you know than, than, than we than we do uh, I, mean, I mean it's something that is debatable but that is my view that you'd have people like uh, you know um, this guy who did uh, ah man I don't want to describe how he looks <clears throat> is a, I don't want to describe what is his name? He did the first film. He was the he did a film on Ma something that also included Mandela. And he came to South Africa with Whoopi Goldberg to 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 make this film. No, not Denzel. No, D that is the, Denzel was still an actor then. In fact, Denzel played in his Malcolm X. Denzel played in one of his movies, which was called Malcolm X. The guy, Spike Lee. Yeah. I mean, Spike Lee would tell you that, look, it was very difficult for him to make films in America, but Spike Lee is a, is a, is a multi-millionaire, you know? And the guy that came after uh, Spike Lee, I think he did Pulp Fiction, if I'm not, no, Pulp Fiction was done by Tarantino. Uh, he did something, man, uh, uh, Boys in the Woods, did he do Boys in the Woods? Yes, John Singleton. You know, they are doing much, much better than we do. Look at Mfundi, you know, Mfundi tried to to, to go into Fisher films. He, he, he left very quickly so, because it is very difficult in South Africa to do that. We tried to go into Fisher films. I mean, we did uh, Blood on Our Hands, and that was the only small feature that we could do. We did Molo Fish. We, where are we today? You know, Molo Fish was this, I think, uh, the first co production that we had in South Africa. The first that we had. But we were squashed and vanquished. You know, just like that. So, this is what happens to most uh, African filmmakers. You know, the the sense of continuity, the sense of institutionalizing the film industry and turning it into a palpable economy that can exist beyond my lifespan is difficult, because we just do not believe in culture. We don't believe in the power of culture. That culture is the most diplomatic seat we have and that we can use to help prosper our people and our economy. We just don't believe in it. That you have tourism, which is a very important industry and sector, but that, that tourism talks about our culture. That, you know, if you can focus so much on tourism, why can't you focus as well as much on culture? you know, the production of culture, because culture, that is like the soil of your soil, your, your soul. It's, you know, it's where the tilling happens. It's where the cultivation of the mind happens. And we are not investing in that, you know. What we are investing in now is a, a hybrid of the hip hop culture we get from uh, what we have learned from Americans, you know. We need to have violence, we need to have sex, we need to have uh, all these mythical, you know, things of witchcraft and whatever. This is what we think is, you know, forms our culture. But over and above that, there is a lot that goes on in our culture that is critical, that is a treasure, that is important, that can actually help our kids to understand who they really are and where we come from. You know, and the power of a people that they are, 
the power of civilization that they have, the so-called civilization, this quaint name that uh, Europeans came to us with, to civilize the already civilized. In fact, we are more, and, and this is the truth, and I'm not saying it because I'm trying to romanticize who I am, but the truth of the matter is that we civilized the world, and it's not a joke when we say it, it's real, it's true, and there are evidence, you know, there's evidence that can actually back, back up what I'm saying. But do our kids know who we are? They don't. Because we don't, we don't allow them the, the right and the privilege to know. So I think, you know, when we talk back to Fepasi and what Bo, Uncle Lionel were trying to do was to try and just say, focus as Africans, you know, focus. Let's look at our way of doing things. Let's go back to how we used to tell stories but also without being narrow and parochial about that, while we move forward into this thing that is called modernity, we should not, like the Sankofa, we should not forget who, looking back, you know, and taking from what we had there, you know, taking all those treasures, opening up that treasure cove and moving forward with it. So, like for instance, so Uncle Lionel. Uncle Lionel is really an epitome of the way we fail ourselves and the way we fail people who are treasures, the way how we allow that treasure cove to be buried, you know, to be buried and never for those graves to be reopened because we just do not know who it is that we have buried today, that our people live with the wealth of ideas and those ideas get buried with them. Because I have never seen, of that time, a film like Johnny and Jemima. Just the charisma in which this thing was made, the beauty, the talent, the uh, you know the aesthetic, the you know just the the freedom of of the director to express this moment in these children's lives and just allow them to, you know, to unravel as kids, to just be who they are. And it was as if the camera was not there. You know, when you see Johnny and Jemima, you don't even feel the presence of the camera because you are right in that scene yourself. That's what the filmmaker does. They carry you straight into the scene. You just love, you are part, you are a parent watching and loving. I, I mean, it's, it, for me it was such a powerful, beautiful treat to see. And that is the only film I saw of Uncle Lena. I never saw anything else after. And when he came back, oh, Uncle Lena, when he came back, what became of him? You know, I remember in 1991, no, was it 1992? You know, I'm not very good with this. Ulebon uh, would be very good, no Muraban Mudis, because they, they uh, you know, as Ulebon is saying, he's an archivist, and he really is telling the truth. Ulebon is a historian, actually. So they, they would remember, but you know, I remember Gaston Kaboru, who was Secretary General of Pepasi at the time, came to South Africa. And this was just after Mandela had come out, and Lebon Tates Sulu, and all of that, and he came. And he said to me, Sipati, he actually, uh, you know, made contact from Burkina Faso, said, Sipati, I'd love to come to South Africa. I said, yo, Gaston, that would be wonderful. I was just in awe of Fepasi and the first park, and I'm like, oh my goodness, you know, Gaston Kabur is going to come to South Africa. This is going to be really wonderful. And he was saying, I'm coming, and I, and he started giving me the dates and all of that. And this was real, like this man was coming. And Gaston Kabore, as the Secretary General of Epasi, was really, truly a fonna. He was an inspirational leader. I, I just looked at him in awe. The, the way he carried himself, the way he carried Epasi, it was just admirable. I mean, like, this was the person, the right person for the job. So I honestly, truly was looking forward to him coming to South Africa and being with South African filmmakers and, of course, you know, film institutions here. So. I went to Uncle Lionel, I said, hey, Uncle Lionel, Lucas Stone no wants to come. He said, can it carry let him come. Plus, you know, uh, Uncle Lionel was 
just part of Fepaz. So, I mean, when he says Ahlet, it's like Fepaz has given its, you know, blessings for him to come in South Africa. So, I said, Uncle Lionel, but he wants to meet with Mandela and Nike, but I don't know these people, so can you please help me? And he said, no, that's not a problem at all. He said, no, but I'll also tell Walisa Road to organize for us to go and meet with Bondati Mandela. And uh, he went to Putwali, and Putwali said, ah, no, it's going to happen. And he came, Augustine. And he met with, uh, we met with Ntati Mandela, we met with uh, at Lutuli House, we met with, um, I think it was called Shell House at the time. And we met with Ntati uh, Sisul, oh, those old, old grandfathers. Ah, no, man, their spirit, you would never say that they spend so much time in, in prison. Their humility, their love. When you see them, just like Uncle Daniel, it's as if you are people you have known all your life and they're just saying, ah, I'm done, I'm, where have you been? Honestly, it's that kind of spirit. They, they're just wonderful, wonderful, unbelievable people who you think that they've reached a different level of consciousness in their lives. They, they've just gone beyond anger, gone beyond hatred. You don't even know what is it that has catapulted them to that level of consciousness. Because when you are with them, you just feel so much love, no trace of bitterness. So when I met with them and Uncle Lionel was there, we took photos and I don't know where those photos are. You know, I was trying to look for some of the photos here, you know. But Abu uh, 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 probably would have some photos on that. But Lubon was not there. I think Lubon was still a child then. It was probably not uh, that. Uh, yeah, I could say Lubon is not that young. <laughs> but you know, it was such for me such a fascinating experience because oh, Uncle Lionel was there, and of course, obviously, always with his either his cigarette or his pipe. And also his little mm, Uncle Lionel. Ah, he never that one. Ah, 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 ah. Don't even try <laughs> with his whiskey. Don't even try. But you know, when they came, <coughs> also what Gaston wanted to do was to help South Africans put up this national film institution because now we had come out of apartheid. And uh, you could only qualify to become a member of a party if you're not in an occupied country or colonized country, or maybe the two mean the same. But you could only apply and become a legitimate member. So if you were not, uh, if you came from uh, Namibia, South Africa, Mozambique, or Zimbabwe at the time, which were not liberated yet, uh, you would not qualify to become a member because you would not have a national institution that would be, uh, you know, legitimately um, accepted because you come from that country. So that country would be sanctioned to that way. So when we got our, our liberation, so-called, uh, he came. And uh, that, the, 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 land, the, the journey was to start up that initiative for us to put up the National Film Institute. So that was a good thing. Um, and that time, SASFED was not uh, organized yet. So it was the independent producers organization. Now the complexity of South Africa actually becomes the point of debate, still, even today. You see, in other countries, you'd find that uh, in a National Film Institute, for instance, you'd find that everyone is black. I I'm just making it, you know, as an example. You'd find that maybe you go to Nigeria. The National Film Institute of Nigeria would be up of black people. Ghana would be the same. Kenya would probably be the same. You know, if you go to uh, to the Maghreb countries, they will be all Ar 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 Arabs, you know. If you go to Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, you'll find the same, it's homogeneous that way. Tina, we don't have that uh, homogeneity. We, we, we have a complex situation, which if we do not deal with it and talk about it, we are going to find ourselves in some kind of a cul-de-sac because other African counterparts want us to deal with the history of South Africa in the same way that they deal with their years. And I'm telling you guys, while I'm alive, it's not possible because people who have an indigenous footing to 
South Africa are not just uh, the band to speak in South Africans. You have the Koi and the Sun. Who are the first people of this region that we are in? Okay, so you have the Koi and the Sun. You have the band to speaking uh, South Africans who are probably not as indigenous, but are indigenous, but we can, we can debate and say, well, we are all from Africa, so how indigenous is indigenous? But when we speak about this, this, this region here that is in the southern region, Namibia, you know, and, and South Africa, Botswana, you, you are getting into territory that is going to be very shifty that way, okay? Because we, we are even forgetting that who, the first people actually are a very important uh, culture and a language with a history which we are not incorporating into our 11 official languages in South Africa. I think uh, in Namibia they, they have done that, if I'm, I understand you to be corrected. So when uh, Gaston comes and he comes to the Independent Producers Organization and he finds 150 companies that are completely white owned and a few that are black owned, not even probably one or two. I mean, I was one of those that had a completely black owned company and guess what happened to it? We were vanquished and that story still has to be told. How could you, why we were swept off the, the face of, uh, of the, of the uh, South African tele, uh, you know, uh, film and television industry? Nobody has even bothered to ask the question. But we were the first people who brought a co-production and changed the policy of South Africa by bringing that first co-production to South Africa, which triggered treaties to be made with other countries, okay? Because that was the first treaty that we had with Canada and other countries followed. But still, even when other countries followed, I can't remember which countries they were there, or I think it was the French or what, we still did not have co-production uh, uh, co treaties with our own continent. We had cultural agreements, maybe with Burkina Faso, but we did not have a, a co-production treaty to show just how serious our oppression is or the oppression of the mind is. It is serious. But coming back to the complexities of dealing with the the South African demographic. You see, in Zimbabwe, whites were probably about 250,000 or 300,000 whites in Zimbabwe. In, uh, if you go to Zimbabwe now, I think there are probably about 30,000 white people. We, you can, you can, you can uh, verify that. I'm too old to, to, be, to be accurate. In Mozambique, you may also have probably the same number of white people. In Namibia, you may have uh, probably a little bit more, a little bit. In South Africa, you have millions of white South Africans. You have millions of South African Indians or Indian South Africans, because the Indian diaspora never forget where they come from. You have millions of colored people who are our people, because my DNA is in them and, and vice versa. So, how are you going to juggle with that kind of demographic? Are you going to say all the five minutes just go and run into the sea and then what happens to those that have affinities in their DNA with, and speak the language Africans, which is now an indigenous language or a hybrid of an indigenous language? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Because now we want to fight this. You know, we want, you fight like it's pull, like a, pour, pour, pouring water into a leaking uh, bucket. You want to fight how this, this fight, the same way that Abo Patrice Lumumba wanted, Abo Kwame Nkrumah, Abo, you know. When Mandela said, let us look at this one differently, we thought he's a sellout. And we still think that he is. But the problem is we're sitting with this huge demographic that we should deal with, that has created a different culture in South Africa. Uzunzani Amakalats, who speak Africans and are proud of it, and you want to kill Africans as a language. Because when we fought it in, and I was in the, seven, in the 70s, I was in the streets that day in 1976. I had on my, the back of my school blazer away with Africans. But we did not say that Africans should die. We said do not impose Africans 
as a language of instruction in our schools as Africans. We don't want that. Stop it. But we did not say kill Africans. We didn't. That is not my understanding of what we were fighting for. Because my sister who spoke Africans, who lived in Tukum's race or North Khesek, was speaking Africans. Why would I say kill Africans when my own sister and brother were speaking Africans and I could speak it with them in Tukum's race and in North Khesek and in El Dorado Park? Who, what gives me the audacity to say kill it? So that is the demographic that we have to deal with and African filmmakers, especially those in South Africa, these are the kinds of things that we should tease and say, let's talk about who we are and where we are trying to go. Let's deal with racism, you know, and the only way to deal with racism is to make sure that we educate ourselves. That is the most important thing, that we provide shelter, we provide good education, good health systems. We make sure that we emancipate our people. Look at China. China doesn't make uh, excuses about the, 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 the West uh, fighting them using opium and trying to kill the Chinese by using opium on them and dragging the hell out of Chinese citizens. They're not making that as an excuse. You never hear the Chinese moaning and groaning every single day about how the West tried to kill them by bringing uh, opium into, their, into China and trying to kill the Chinese, putting them into a, a, a mass lull of, a, of, a, of a, a drunk, addicted, you know, a, 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 a nation. No, they don't moan about it. What they said was, we are going to be a, become a dragon economy and we are going to make sure that we become that in the 21st century. By the 21st century, we should be the first in the world, and they are. Did you, do you hear them moaning about Hong Kong, what happened to them in Hong Kong? About the British uh, taking over a, 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 a territory of China? Do you hear them moaning about it every single day? What is happening now? We are flooded by the Chinese here. In every market, they are killing almost every economy they find standing. Amachai. Tinasi B, Zilla. No, let them go to the sea. No, let them go. Instead of creating alternative industries, instead of making sure that this industry that is called the cultural industry stands. You know, Lerato, in the 90s, late 90s when we, or mid 90s, when we put up the National Film, Film and Video Foundation, because it was put up during my time when I was still active. I think it was given about, Joe, maybe 20 million or 25 million, I don't, I can't remember. And then after a while in the 2000s, it had about 35 million. This is a National Film Institute. A National Film Institute. You don't give it five billion to, to just start it up. You give it, 35 million, or maybe even 100 million, or maybe even 200, 200 million. What is that? How are you going to even start developing an economy, giving a National Film Institute that kind of money when we lose trillions to looting? How do you juggle these two? You know where you come from. You know the looting that happened before you came in to reclaim your freedom. You find these institutions as monopolies of control and oppression. Instead of you reversing that trajectory, no, when you make it worse, you dilapidate the infrastructure that you find because you have no affinity to it. You do not think that this infrastructure that I'm depleting is actually made by my own sweat with my own wealth that is drawn from the soil of my country. No, you say into a Zabelungulis. Forgetting that that wealth that has put that brick up is yours. You know what Ngungu uh, Tiongo says? He says, Africa needs men who are born into wealth and can manage it even when they are sleeping. He says, it will be a painful day when you give diamonds to pigs, because all they will do is to trample them into a mud. When you give land to trash, to a man who can't even take a jigger off his toe, to a man who can't even take a lighter under his belt, 
and you give them land to manage, they will trash it to no end. And look at what is happening to our infrastructure, our railways, our cities. And we think this is a white man's property. Aina Dabanat. When our, 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 our grandfathers actually were the ones who were singing social laws in the street, building those things and putting down those railways. Now, I, I want to tell you about, about, about Uncle Lionel. No, Uncle Lionel, when he left, did we care? We, we were very, we were very, you know, negligent in the way we treated him. Because we'd call him to one thing, like, you know, like when you, you know, like a boutique kind of a relationship with him. You know, when you go to a boutique, you go once in a while. Because boutiques are expensive, you know, they're exclusive. You, you can't afford to, to go to them all the time unless you are rich. That's how we treated him. We treated him like a, some kind of a boutique, in, you know, like, oh, Uncle, 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 we were going to have a, a conference today or a seminar here, and then can you come and make a little speech? And he was like a little prop. The Chinese understand their dynasties and they make use of them. That's why even the Arabs they understand the power of the Ayatollah. Japan Singh, they understand the power of their dynasties. They understand the power of their elders. That that is where you mine your wisdom. And nobody cared to put him down and say, Uncle Lionel, let us just have this discussion just on the African film landscape. Tell us what you know and tell us what you think and advise on how we should move forward. And just do a proper chat with him. And when you put down these pillars that he's talked, he talks about, you put them down while he's still there and he can see that the future is in good hands. Saturday we will do a Lionel Ngakane Award. This was a, what Edim Balo as the CEO of Philento, the NABF, wished to see. Even Ulibon, I think Ulibon was actually the one driving it. And what, what, what did it amount to? To nothing. We can't even put one little award for Uncle Len and say, you know, for best filmmaker, because he was a, <laughs> an abundantly talented uh, filmmaker, Uncle Len. We don't even do that. Now we leave it in the family's hands, which is, I think, also an important landmark that you are taking on that bait on and saying, you know what, let the spirit live. Let the spirit live. And that is very important, what you are doing. But what I'm saying is that we take the treasures that we have for granted. We trample on them and then we praise them when they are dead. It's too late. You know, I think what you need to do when, when you t talk about, you know, the uh, uh, stories on social justice, look at what the Jews have done. The Jews have made us never to forget about the Holocaust. And, and, and the way they've treated the issue of the Holocaust, they've made it become a global issue. So what happened to about uh, six million people is made for us to feel that every essence of that pain has to be shared. So they managed to break through with that kind of narrative to make it a global uh, uh, essence of our day-to-day -day life. Anti-Semitism, you talk about it, you get yourself into trouble, okay? If you are seen to be I guess, saying things that are disparaging to, 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 to Jews, you get yourself into trouble because they are a very powerful, uh, you know, collective of thought. And that thought they sell. They sell and it's profitable. Now, we are not talking about what happened to us. So if we're not talking, and this is what Uncle Lionel is saying. Uncle Lionel says, allow South Africans to tell stories that speak not only about today, but about their past too. He says it, he said it, and it's somewhere it's, it's recorded. 
He says, because you cannot ignore what happened in the past and think that you're going to build a future, ignoring that. You have to drag that into your present, know about it, talk about it, deal with the aftermath of it, and then move forward together as a nation. If you cannot do that, you will never, ever be a nation. So social justice, do you talk about the things that are terrifying to talk about, the things that are disturbing to talk about, the things that are haunting, the things that are embarrassing to talk about? Do you talk about them so that you can start making this will that you want for a future that has a nation that is more united than divided? Are you prepared to be bold enough to talk about it? No, we are not. All we do is escapist films that uh, give us Bo, Bo Kim Kardashian, uh, versions of Kim Kardashian, you know, different versions of that, uh, different versions of, uh, you know, of, 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 of things that are, are easy to deal with, you know, but uh, the hard stuff, we, the, 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 what happened to us, you know, the, all the atrocities that happened, we, we just don't want to talk about them. You know, we had a, I think in fact, South, Africa, South African uh, filmmaking, the aesthetic of it and the, uh, and the relevance of it was actually for me probably more informative and more insightful in the 80s to the 90s. Because that time, filmmakers of all races, especially white, because that time white people still had the uh, means of production, control of the means of production. So they were the ones who were having all these tools. They were the ones who had studios. They were the ones who had production houses. They were the ones who were owning Boste, Kiniko. So they had the, uh, the capacity. And then, of course, from that, you had Bo, Bo Jamie Ace, Bo Andre Brink, Bo uh, the Haynes films. You had that uh, type, which were just purely looking at making white films which were relevant to white people, you know, or propaganda films, whatever you would want to call them, which just raised the, you know, the, 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 the sense of self-worth and of for especially Africans, because you must remember that Africans also had their own uh, uh, experience of uh, the British, in, you know, the colonized by the British in South Africa. So. You had those kinds of films that were uh, with subsidies that were just looking at uh, making sure that African film making was really becoming an important part of our cultural economy. And then uh, uh, you, 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 so, so, so you had that, but out of that, you had a new kind of uh, generation of filmmakers who were, did not like what was happening in South Africa. They didn't like to be part of this apartheid regime. So they started creating what is called a resistance uh, film, film, films or guerrilla kind of filmmaking. You had the, uh, the video news uh, services, which I was a part of, which were making films, Kabum, so I can bully, and you know, a detention with, without, without trial. And th this were lots of, of films that were made like that, which were seriously political and were showing atrocities of apartheid. And they were channeled out of South Africa like this, into Holland, into Germany, and, uh, and places like that, because they wanted people to see what was happening. So it was like a, an underground kind of filmmaking on social justice. This was really very important. Abu Cyril Ramaphosa, we used to go and shoot them when they were doing their, as he, when he was still SGO of Noom and, uh, and Bojay and I do, the unionists and all. We were right there in the trenches. We have archives and archives of films on the political landscape of South Africa and what happened to South Africans and how they were brutalized by apartheid. We have all of that. And where are those archives? Where are those archives? I'm telling you, this was a, a pumping a resistance movement, which I had, uh, a, a network, that a project that I was managing, which was called the Video 
suitcase mobile cinema where we put suitcase uh, in the suitcases we put uh, films that were looking at education and looking at child's pregnancies and you know talking about those kinds of things and then underneath there we put bohala in you know like all this seriously very strong bo the battle of algiers you know all these revolutionary films underneath and when people go and see you say make them watch this you on on top you have this uh, ones i uh, talk about teenage pregnancies and Napa, you put women of the south where how australians treated people in australia the aborigines and how they brutalized families and tore them apart and in Napa, Nati, you know we had uh, other films like that which we were getting yes Kisho, get it. the battle of algiers first was one of them and then we showed bo osman's and Benes films you know med hondo uh, harvest three harvest three thousand you, you 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 learned just like we did when we discovered bo Chinua Achebe and Bo uh, you know. So that kind of, of resistance movement is gone. We don't have it anymore. It's like, no, we found this freedom, but we haven't, we are not free yet. So there is no time for us to relax. So social justice uh, films are completely taken out of the, out of the scope of, uh, of cinema as we wanted to, to have it and know it as part of our, our transformation tool. Because the only way you can transform the mind is to bring history into it. Tell the mind what happened so that it can be critical in its decision or critical in its thinking and critical in its analysis when it charges forward into the future. So I'm telling you, we have archives of films that were made where you would be shocked at what happened to us in uh, in South Africa in the you know in the past 50 years I don't want to go back to Boma 400 years just the recent past of 50 years no it does exist it does exist there's a whole a series that was called uh, War and Peace that was made, which, which looked at, uh, uh, I think it went as far as the 60s, you know, begins with the Shabville movement and, you know, and, and, and you saw the PACs there, the, the, and then of course the ANC. The thing is that, you know, it's also this council culture that we have now, which is really very prominent now, this, but this council culture has been there for, for a very long time where other parts of our liberation movement is taken out of the uh, of the of the of the of the uh, equation of uh, you know our liberation struggles like the pan african congress you know like the black consciousness movement you know the united democratic uh, mass movement all of those are like chucked out you know but uh, the liberation of this country began here i was here it was here in the 80s, the Bipatong, the, the, not, uh, the 90s, the Bipatong massacre, it, it was not a joke. But when people died here and fought back, in the 70s, I was there, Lerato. In the seven, 1976, I was running in the street that day. I remember when Hector Peterson was killed. I was there. So, Utsieti Mashinini unraveled things that, no, I mean, when he... When he, 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 he evoked the spirit of the youth, there was no turning back. So I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, diminishing what uh, people from exile did. They played a very b big and important role. But the sweat and the blood that was shed was here. And it is real. Konabantu, who are buried, we don't even know who they are and where they are even today because their families do not have voices. One last thing that I will, I'll, I'll say is that when I say this, these are stories that have to be told and are untold and still remain untold. You know, I, I honestly, I've not been in films for 15 years or so. I honestly, I tried, I tried to wreck my brains, but I can tell you that uh, Sarah Maldoro, 
stands out as one of our pioneer filmmakers. You know, because I think she started making films in the 70s or 60s, I, I, I'm not too sure, but she is the mother of cinema. She stood up and held her own. And then, of course, we have uh, Safi Fai from uh, Senegal, who also just stood up and uh, like a little thorn, you know, in this milieu of all these, uh, you know, uh, patriots who were patriarchs of the film industry. And uh, Yuzan Palsi with uh, Dry White Seas. In fact, she wanted me to work with him in 1988, and and uh, I think she's like, oh, this is one is probably too, still too young in the in the in the in the land of <laughs> in this journey of filmmaking. So I was still a student then, but she also just uh, is, was for me a remarkable uh, filmmaker, very very remarkable. And of course, you know what? Even though. Uh, I don't know where to really place Mirane, but Mirane for me is a fascinating filmmaker. Because uh, when she made this latest film, I think she did uh, Mississippi Masala. If, I, if, I, if, I, if I've got the title right, and it was just beautiful. The way she makes films. But you know, you think that, okay, she's more on the Indian side, but then she made this one with uh, this, young act uh, this young actress now. A Kenyan American. Ah, why am I forgetting that? The chest, the chest one. Hey, the chest, the chest. Hey. Oh. It's just like, you know, I mean, these are people that remind me of Uncle Lionel. When you make a film and somebody just transplant you into the scene, you've just become part of it. Your soul is in there, it's thrown in there. You cry, you laugh, you, you know. Every single time they walk, you walk with them. That, 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 is a, that is a very powerful talent from a filmmaker. If they can afford to impel the audience like that, ah. So now, I, I, I think those are, you know, the, the, the very remarkable filmmakers. And of course, here in South Africa, I miss the fact that Kubu Met is not, is not, is not seriously considered as a filmmaker. And uh, we had Palisa Litlaka, who I also felt that she could have been one of our most amazing filmmakers. And she just disappeared. They both disappeared. Ukubu Met just, she loves, she loves the craft. She is passionate about it. A very centric, somewhat, <laughs> you know, crazy like all of us, but passionate. And we focus on the character and not on the talent. She, she fights too hard because that's what she does. Kubu fights too hard and I marginalize her. But if you are a filmmaker and not a fighter, then you are in the wrong industry. Because the first thing that you need to fight for is the integrity of your story. That's where everything begins. So, so you have to know how to be a warrior when you get into this craft. Because image is a personality journey. It's an identity journey. You need to make sure that you understand its quality, you understand its integrity, and you understand its power to influence. Image is not something to joke about. People kill for image. There are those uh, French cartoonists who were making some whatever images about Mohammed, and they got killed. Image is a, it's a, image is a, it's a, a, it's a serious contender for, for war. But la, you can say whatever you want and go Zuelitin or go uh, our other kings here. And, uh, and old people like Bozuma do lots of stuff. Mm -hmm. Whatever Zuma can be. But you're into, you know, how, how, how do we, what have we become? How, how, do we, how do we just violate images of people like that? What, what have we become? You may not agree with the person, but to violate the
person's inner soul like that, what, 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 what is it? What does it say about us? What is it that we have adopted? I am Sipati Bulani Hopper and uh, I truly wholeheartedly support this initiative that you are taking on of the Lionel Nagani Foundation. It was supposed to have been done a long time ago while he was still alive.